great. I think that uh, democracy needs an upgrade. Who, who thinks government and democracy need an upgrade? So, who, who saw Joe's talk on Wednesday? Okay. Um, who's already voted with their feet? Well, who's, who's a, a New Hampshire native? And who's moved to New Hampshire to be part of the Free State Project? Okay, so we've got a few people out here who have already voted with their feet and decided that moving to a new jurisdiction is the best way for them to find the government they want to be a part of. And that's the idea of sea setting. I'm going to kind of, since I'm preaching to the choir about liberty, I'm going to race through some liberty ideas uh, and not dwell on it too long. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about this project I've been working on for the past couple of years called the Floating City Project and our near-term goals to get the first floating city going, uh, hopefully by the end of this decade. Um, and then we'll do a Q&A. And hopefully Joe will be back here and he'll join me. And uh, you can ask him questions if you have leftover ideas from the last talk. Let's test this technology. Oop. Cool. Uh, that's me. Um, you know, as I said here, you know, we, we want to do sea setting because it's the last unclaimed place on earth where we can peacefully try new societies. So it's an alternative approach to going someplace altogether and, and trying to see if we can take over that place. Um, when I look at this map, you think to yourself, you know, are some of these nations more free? Where could I go to? And what shocks me who here thinks that freedom is both free markets and free people? Right? So it shocks me when I learn that the places with, that there's such a lack of correlation between free markets and free people. And if you look at this slide here, you know, whoops. Um, you know, Hong Kong and Singapore rate as the most free market nations in the world. Uh, nearly indistinguishable, yet Singapore's locking up almost twice as many people as Hong Kong. So does that lead us to believe then that Singaporeans are twice as bad? Um, you know, same thing with Australia and Switzerland, nearly the same in their economic freedom index, yet Australians are apparently, you know, almost twice as bad as people from Switzerland. And then here's our embarrassing statistic. You know, we're the 12th most free economically, yet we, uh, you know, the only people that lock up more than us is the Seychelles. Uh, at the bottom of the slide, you can't see it. There's Cuba. Uh, I don't have data on North Korea, and China might be something in there, but they kill their criminals. So um, I don't know where they're at. But um, look here, India and Nepal, very low on the economic freedom. But they lock up so few people. So in some ways, they're more free than we are you're less likely at least end up behind bars. Um, you know, Hong Kong, they restrict their citizens in you know, same-sex marriages. Uh, Singapore has restrictions on freedom of the press. Uh, in the U.S., where can you go and carry a beer on the street besides Vegas and New Orleans? Uh, maybe someplace here in New Hampshire I don't know about. Um, you know, and, and we get further in my talk, you know, some of my colleagues who are working on projects around the world trying to create free cities within existing nations, one that's happening right now is in Honduras, and there's this rhetoric that says, if we can have a free zone in a place with a free market, then we'll instantly overnight have a new Singapore. And when you go down, and I think we're going to hear that in the Liberal Land talk tomorrow, there's a lot of ideas. If we go out to Liberal Land, have this little free spot, uh, with the liberty will come all this money, and then we'll have you know, a new Singapore. When, when you go into Honduras and you tell somebody, I want to create a new Singapore here, they think, oh, that's the place where they um, you know, get thrown in jail for spitting on the streets or chewing gum. And so it doesn't sound like freedom to them. Um, so let's see. Oops. So each of us, you know, are born into a fixed geography, and some, uh, some government claims to own us. But, you know, what if we think that that government steals too much from us? Uh, you know, it's really hard to switch to a competing provider. You know, you have limited ideas, we'll come to New Hampshire, and that's a competing provider, but, uh, you know, you're still strangled by our federal government. 
Uh, and you know, a, one of the clearest depictions of how an arbitrary line of a border affects people, this is a picture of North Korea and South Korea at night. And that, whoops, not good with this pointer. That line right there is the border. Uh, these people down here, they live 15 years longer. They grow inches taller. They're 12 times as rich than these people up here, all because this border was drawn back in the 40s after a war. So it's, a, it's sad for them what your nation can do to you and how important rules are. This, whoops, every time. This border right here, you know, that depicts, you know, how good your life is likely to be on what side of that border you're born. I believe what the famed economist Manker Olson says, that uh, smaller localized governments uh, will result in more freedom and more prosperity. That it's easier for us to make decisions in a smaller localized group. Uh, we are descendants of tribal people and that's how we're used to making decisions. And as I'll talk about in a moment, the problem we have is that we come from that evolution and we think that our voice is important because it was in a small tribal setting your voice is important but when we get to hundreds of millions of people your voice is just a, a small sand on the beach and it's very difficult to make effective change so here's an example of a small localized place Hong Kong um, you know when Hong Kong gained its freedom uh, 30, 40 years ago, uh, over the next generation, it became that. People became 17 times richer, or it grew 87 times. Uh, farmers who toiled in rice fields put their kids directly into the professional class. In Singapore, uh, when it broke away from Malaysia, half of its population was illiterate. 45 years later, 17% of the population is millionaires. And in Africa, on uh, most uh, measures of well-being, it's gone backwards over the past few decades. But that little dot of light off the coast, that's a place called Mauritius. And in 1975, 40% of its people were in poverty. In 2011, 90% of them owned their own homes. So we think as seasteaders that there's a limitless opportunity for this kind of liberty with small governments and localized governments, and it belongs out at sea. Uh, and our dream is that when we have thousands of nations blooming on the high seas, the policies that we enact will be good models and will then help those people who are landlocked at home. And the evidence of this can be seen in China. You had Hong Kong, it liberalized its markets, communism failed, and then China started creating all these special economic zones over the past uh, decade or so, you know, more people have come out of poverty in China than anywhere else in the world. So I'm going to talk for a minute here about special economic zones uh, and how they're a model for the floating city project. Uh, and these are also known as free trade zones or free ports or factory zones. And around the world we find that there's a bunch more oops, private uh, free trade zones or special economic zones than there are public ones. And if we ask ourselves why, and this audience is probably a pretty obvious answer, why are the private ones doing better? Well, you know, it's less expensive to develop the private zone and they operate better, uh, you know, when there's competition in the marketplace. So here's some examples of why we can look at private cities or what we can look to as a private city for a model of what we could do with uh, limited or no government. And we consider malls are small little cities. They have their own security force. Um, they might have a clinic inside of them. They might have a hotel attached where people will stay the night. Um, is that New York? No, that's the New York Casino in Vegas. It also has its own security force, uh, clinics. People stay the night there for weeks on end. Uh, sometimes they get stuck to the poker table and don't get away. This is the biggest building by volume in the world where they create Boeing airplanes. 30,000 people go through here every day for work. They have trains. They have um, 19 cafeterias, their own banking system inside. So these are examples. Right, here's one more. 
uh, Highlands Ranch in Colorado, 90,000 residents, 30,000 homes, biggest private homeowner association, and guess who builds the roads? And in New York, there's this co-op city in the Bronx, uh, completely owned by the people. If you rent there, you're an owner there, and you have say. So, and they have places of worship and medical care and grocery stores, et cetera. So everybody that came to Joe's talk heard the whole spiel on how a floating city is basically a cruise ship. And you know, again, when you get on this ship, you make a deal. They're going to give you medical care. They're going to give you security. You're going to choose the place that you're going to arbitrate your differences if you have to go to court with them. Uh, Estonia did something really novel this past uh, two years ago now. They issued e-residency, which is going to make it easy for those of us outside of Estonia to do business there. So we wonder to ourselves, what else could we do? What else is possible? And you know, coming from Silicon Valley, I like this idea of dynamic democracy. So I imagine to myself, I don't like, um, I don't like Senator Feinstein. And, uh, <laughs> She's been my senator for life, and she's going to be in there until she quits. There's no way to get around her. Uh, and same with Barbara Boxer. And how are these two people representing all of California? I want an upgrade. And I think that in dynamic democracy, if I could use the power of the internet, like I use Facebook, I could vote for people. Uh, I could vote for ideas, and we could constantly change them out, and I could be represented not having my whole state represented by some dinosaur. You know, seasteading is really the idea that if we vote with our feet, we get more choice. That if we can go out and choose our government like you shop for a house or a phone, we can have more choice. So there's two ways that we can do this. One that I'm going to go over first is actually finding a state that allows you to do this within their state. And then the second is to go someplace ungoverned. So when we try to get permission from a state, um, you know, we need to find a way where they, you make a deal with them. They say, this, this would be good for you and good for us. And this comes in, you, know, you have one country with many different systems inside of it, and it comes in many models. There's a charter cities model, a startup cities model, leap zones, free cities, model cities, and then we'll get to my floating city project. Um, real quickly, a charter city is this idea that probably a developing nation, a failed state, would say to itself, um, we'll let you have this area of land that's city size, it's undeveloped, you know, where there's not many people there. You come in, build, um, you know, and we export the law to someplace else. Uh, you know, let's say Canada is going to be the jurisdiction over some city in Central America. Um, often not popular because people look at it as colonialism. Uh, I have a friend down in Guatemala who's working on the startup cities idea where he would try to take existing cities and help them implement the best practices from around the world. Um, a leap zone takes the special economic zone, but it adds three other components, which are legal, administrative, and political. Uh, so you're really installing a whole new jurisdiction as opposed to just saying this is a tax-free place. The big vision of sea setting would be a thousand nations blooming out on the high seas. Uh, this is our co-founder and, and largest funder, Peter Thiel. Uh, back in 2008, he met with my friend, Patry Friedman, and said, I love your ideas. Here's some money. Go explore it. And that's what we've been doing ever since. Um, I'll just read what Peter says for those of you who can't see it. We may have reached the stage at which settling the oceans is economically feasible or will soon be feasible. It is less realistic risk. And for this reason, I eagerly support this initiative. This is my project, the Floating City Project. And what I'm trying to do right now is build a coalition of entrepreneurs, investors, builders, naval engineers, aqu uh, aquaculturalists, people who are eager to go and pioneer a new floating city with me. And I'm also trying to secure a relationship with a host nation. So it's a compromise between going out to the high seas and coming into doing a, a free zone on land. And our compromise is we don't have to take any of your land. You don't have to give anything up. You just let us put our free city off your coast. You'll get the economic benefits. You'll get the trade. 
you'll get environmental benefits from us, and we get a place where we can explore freedom. So that, that's a picture of these floating islands on the Han River in Seoul, Korea, that I think are um, awfully beautiful and would be exciting to be living in off the coast of some nation. So I actually kind of said this. We, we need a host because um, it would be cheaper for us. So we, we've done research, and if we wanted to go out to the high seas, uh, a quick little geopolitical lesson. The high, um, international waters goes 12 miles out. Uh, it goes another 12 miles as your contiguous zone. Uh, in that zone, you can't do anything uh, that would be considered threatening to the neighboring nation. But the exclusive economic zone goes 200 miles out or the uh, continental shelf. And in that case, it means that we could be floating 12 and a half miles out, but we might not be able to use anything below the water. So you might not be able to raise fish in a cage without the host nations or the neighboring nations saying you're in our exclusive economic zone. So really, to be truly free in the high seas, we'd have to go at least 200 miles out. And to be 200 miles out means we're, you know, the, the going technology for that is a semi-submersible rig, it's like an oil rig, it's like a big giant metal thing or concrete thing that the waves can crash underneath. And our research says that might cost us a half a billion dollars to host about 300 people on like a, squ a, a small square city block. And it's less appealing. People don't, there's only so many people that want to be that far away from society or, you know, their creature comforts, feature comforts. And so, if we can be near shore, we can bring that cost down tenfold. Um, and it would be easier for people to you know, go to and from. I imagine putting our floating city someplace that you can hop on a plane from New York and, uh, and be there in a matter of hours rather than days. And also, you know, being out at the high seas, as much as we'd like to believe there is freedom, um, you know, there still is international law we have to contend with. And, you have to have a flag of an existing nation, otherwise you're considered a pirate ship. And honestly, the biggest threat to us, you know, on this side of the hemisphere would be the United States Navy, and on the other side of the hemisphere would probably be the Chinese Navy. So what I imagine doing is getting this group of entrepreneurs and investors and businessmen and architects and pioneers together and building out a small, a few blocks you know, with a few businesses on it to test the case, to prove the point that we want to live there and people are happy. And then as this city grows, it'll become a village with hundreds of people and then thousands of people. And it'll be a place that we can be free from capital and currency controls. We can be free from unnecessary and burdensome regulation. We can be free from, you know, we can do medical tourism and medical innovation without the Food and Drug Administration or the European Medical Agency. We can prototype technologies that will make sea, um, pioneering the high seas more possible. And as somebody that cares about the planet and cares about the ocean, I'm confident that we can do this in a way that would be environmentally beneficial to our neighbors and to the ocean as a whole. Right now, the biggest detriment to the ocean, obviously, is humans. Uh, it comes in the forms of uh, agriculture runoff, fertilizer that's going into the ocean and causing the, the ocean to uh, become acidic. And it's also coming in because we go to the oceans as hunters and gatherers. It's the last place we do that. You know, on land, we grow our food and we grow our animals. But out at sea, we just hunt them down. And we all know what's happened to deplete the, uh, the fish population. So we think that we can put in uh, technologies on our city that bioremediate things that are coming from the land. And these would look in terms of this big cage fishing. Uh, this is one of my friends, Neil. Uh, he has these going in Hawaii. Well, he had them going in Hawaii. But because of U.S. regulations, he's been forced to Mexico. He, he just can't get past the NIMBYs out there and, and grow uh, sushi-grade fish that wasn't polluting anybody, that was good to eat, that uh, didn't take from the ocean, yet there's too many NIMBYs in Hawaii to let him move the project forward, so now he's down in La Paz, Mexico. And we'd like to take him with us to our floating city. So. For the past few years, we've been doing market research and trying to figure out who wants to come out to a floating city. And thousands of people have come to our website and filled out our survey and told us about themselves and expressed their hopes and dreams to be a part of our project. And uh, you know, I say with confidence that there is a market for a floating city that people would buy in. 
So that's our, our survey data, and this is our anticipated market. But I think, just to be honest, I think I have a little bit of a lesson to learn from the Free State Project uh, compared to how many people have said they're going to move here and how many people have actually moved here so far. So I hope to kind of have that banter in the Q&A here in a minute. Um, one of the big criticisms that we get in Silicon Valley is that C setting is just something for our rich billionaires to escape taxes and run away. And you know, here's our data set that shows that the majority of people um, are not millionaires. Um, they're making you know, less than $50,000 a year or less than a quarter million dollars a year. We have a few you know, millionaires that have said they want to come with us. People are willing to pay 60% and willing to pay $500 to $600 a square foot. It's an average price for a metropolis. Uh, and some will pay more. And you'll see in a minute that our research, our, um, we think that we can build for uh, $500 a square foot. So if we can sell for $600 a square foot, you know, that's a 20% profit on these things. Uh, so we hired this company in the Netherlands called DeltaSync. And uh, they did a case study or an uh, engineering study for us. Um, what we told them was important is that it had to be affordable for our market. Um, it had to be stable in the sea. That's what seakeeping means. You know, people don't want to get sick when they're out there. They want to not feel like you're bobbing up and down. Um, dynamic geography is our uh, technical term for you float and you can move your house away from your neighbor when they upset you and go join the other seastead where they have a better government. Um, people want the water experience. They don't want to be out in the middle of the ocean and not connected to the water. So that was important to us. And um, I guess movability is the same as dynamic geography. Well, but you know, in, in, the, in the instance that we're not trying to put these on pillars, we want to be able to really exit, get out of the path of a hurricane, float down into another nation if need be. So you know, we've asked them to find these things that are you know, scalable, that can grow you know, from small to large. Um, environmentally friendly, friendly, durable. We don't want them to be wrecked. We want them to last 100 years or more. Um, the, the oil rigs that we use now out in the ocean are only built for 20 years. And ships come to dry dock every five years and get taken out of the water. So a lot of times you'll hear people, why don't you start with a cruise ship? Well, it's an interesting idea, but it's, it's, it's not cheap. You, even if you can get a used cruise ship or a free cruise ship, you're, you're biting off somebody else's problem. And, you're going to have to take it out of the water every five years and fix the hull. So um, we imagine building our city out of squares or pentagons or hexagons so they can connect in these shapes. So I, I misspoke. We think that we can make the gross space $400 a square foot and the issuable space about $500 a square foot. It's probably hard to see that in black on the screen. Um, the material we're looking to use is concrete that's reinforced with something like basalt uh, because it will last 100 years or so in the ocean. Um, and we're imagining putting three-story buildings on top of these structures. So we think when we get 11 of these platforms together, uh, we could host 225 to 300 residents. And this would be a project of about $167 million. I want to show you a video that I think really captures what we want to build. So the idea here is that we have this big floating breakwater surrounding our city that could then protect all the modules on the inside and make it easy for people to move in and out. And I love this idea of the dynamic geography. We tried to show that we want to be environmentally friendly. We put a bunch of solar panels in here.
who wants to live there? Luke and Loris made this video. Um, I'm pointing them out over here. Wait. Thanks so much for volunteer that video. Thousands of hours, I presume. I could have never done that. I'm, I'm uh, super grateful, Luke. Appreciate it, Loris. Um, so, yeah, um, we've got 10 minutes for Q&A. Uh, come on up to the microphone and, and let me have it. Did you say um, an area near Korea was one of um, your top list on, your, on the top of your list right now? Can I say what areas are on the top of my list? K Korea? No, I didn't say Korea. I, I said that there's a river in Korea that has uh, floating islands that are examples. Um, we think that uh, nations that are still developing have more to gain in terms of offering us liberty. Uh, so there's a, a better quid pro quo there if you say, hey, you know, we're going to bring a bunch of people down and they're going to bring you industry and trade and hire your people, uh, we're more likely to get someplace. Whereas if we were to try to go to the U.S. government and say, give us a bunch of liberty just off your coast, they're going to say, why? So I, I presume if you're marketing to U.S. citizens to come live on this uh, floating city, uh, one of the big issues is going to be they're still U.S. citizens, so they still have to pay U.S. taxes. Are you thinking of working with the host country to help get them citizenship there quickly or that kind of thing? Absolutely. I think it's a real important part of the host nation deal. So, I mean, and just to clarify, you know, we're an international movement. In my survey data set, 45% of the people that say they want to come to a floating city are from outside the United States. I have 100 volunteer ambassadors and Half of them are from outside the United States. I got people in South Africa, New Zealand, India, up in the Nordic regions. So it's, it's an international body. And what would excite me about living on the first seastead is the new culture that will emerge. Um, you know, right now we kind of are stuck where we're at in a, in a lot of the world just because of history. And on a seastead, people are going to come there because they share an ideology but they might not share the same language, and they might not share the same skin color. And I'd be excited to see what kind of culture emerges out of that. Do you have different zones where you say that you just wouldn't go because of the weather or certain issues like that? Yeah, I mean, we, it's, it's you know, kind of false for us to say that 70% of the world's an ocean and we can go anywhere when you know, some of it's frozen, some of it has hurricanes, some of it's you know, less inviting. But, so yeah, definitely areas. Um, you know, for the first floating city that I'm working on, I want to be uh, someplace where we know the waves are, are pretty mild and the wind conditions are pretty mild and we're not in a hurricane path. So, so can you give us some idea of what you're looking at initially or areas that you think would be more Welcome. I mean, there's places in Central and South America that are below and above the hurricane paths that are uh, appealing to us. Uh, there's places in Asia that are appealing to us. Um, personally, I'm a warm weather guy, but you know, we could go north as well. Th th there's less uh, developing nations up north to get a deal with. You mentioned you were looking at many host uh, countries and you had just failed, but congratulations for trying. Thank you. Uh, could you name some of them, including the one that you were working on up until recently? Yeah, well, I mean, it's probably a little obvious to people to pay attention, but Honduras was the nation that I was working closest with. Um, it seemed like it was going to be a low-hanging fruit because they passed a legislation there that uh, allows for them to create new zones with new jurisdictions in them. And, um, you know, we spent a year and a half working with them, and I can't say that it's completely off the table. I'd just say it's on ice. And right now, I need to put my energies elsewhere. Um, so, you know, we have some, uh, what we need is warm introductions. It's kind of hard just to send off a letter to some government and have them take you seriously. So that's what we're looking for is warm introductions places. And we have a few. Well, Porkfest, thank you so much for bringing me out. I really enjoy getting to meet so many awesome people.